It's Thursday, November 21st, 2013. I'm Jimmy Principe. I'm Sydney Foster. And I'm Trey Comstock. Putting your final orders because this is Tech's Last Call, episode 51. Your last call for Tech News of the Week tonight. Jimmy's excited about a pencil. Sydney doesn't understand the money. And I celebrate both Microsoft and Sony holidays. But we start tonight with Dropbox and their crazy new valuation. Yeah, so when you think of companies rolling in dough, Dropbox is probably not a name that immediately comes to mind. Uh, But we may need to adjust our expectations. Uh, The cloud storage company is looking to raise $250 million in investments, uh, which puts them at a current valuation of about $8 billion. That's lots of money. That's not chump change, as they say. Uh, So depending on who you ask, there are a couple different pictures of what Dropbox's revenue currently looks like. Um, According to an article in Bloomberg Businessweek, the revenue is currently in the hundreds of millions. Because, you know, that's not a vague number range at all. That doesn't give you a lot of things, but if you ask uh, a venture capitalist, and I'm going to mispronounce his name, is it Omalik? Malik? Omalik. Omalik. All right. There you go. I have sure. two kids in my class named Malik, so spell the name the same way. Uh, if they're on a run, uh, anyway, so according to him, this guy, Mr. O.M., uh, they're on a run to hit $1 billion within a year. So a little bit of a variation there. Um, so Dropbox coming out to play with the big kids. Uh, our question really is, though, what will they do with all this growing wealth? I mean, one of the suggestions that I've heard is that um, they're going to start to buy their own server infrastructure, right? Because right now they're hosted on Amazon servers um, in what's Amazon's called the S3 service, which actually, by the way, is the same thing that hosts Netflix, which is kind of ironic considering Amazon and Netflix are competitors, and yet Netflix uses Amazon storage infrastructure. So go figure. Um, but that's one suggestion. I mean, th- there's been rumors flying around, and they've made statements to the effect that they want to start getting into the enterprise side of things. Um, and so part of getting into the enterprise side of things could well be controlling their own scalability. Um, so they can ramp up servers or ramp down servers whenever they want and not have to worry about Amazon and paying them for their own hosting. You know, crazy idea. What if Dropbox were to buy uh, BlackBerry? Because that way they could have the internet. No, but seriously, no, if they I, want to get into the enterprise and they want to get enterprise level servers and enterprise level security. I just, I just think value wise, I don't think they have the money yet. And sell I the mean, hardware. I mean, that's the, basically what you do. Their whole company is worth about only a hundred percent more than BlackBerry, right? <laughs> um, that's that's but, just well, a waiting game. You just got to wait till BlackBerry is worth nothing. <laughs> no, but I mean, BlackBerry has two billion in patents. No, that's I, true. So I, I just don't. But no. Anyways, that, that was just a like pie in the sky. No, I. Eight billion dollars. That's a big number. I that, mean, it's a remarkably big number for. Uh, I, I saw something that Pinterest is currently valued at three point eight billion dollars. So yeah, and they Dropbox also just worth- got or just put out for a round of two hundred twenty two two hundred twenty five million um, in additional <laughs> that's, funding. That's lots of money. That is, that's lots of money. They also announced this week that something about travel pinning, and I don't, I, I literally <laughs> could not care less. So, so some- Sydney, what's going on with Pinterest? <laughs> I, it's been a honestly, it has probably been. I don't know, a good six months since I've been on Pinterest. It's been a while. Oh, poor Pinterest. They're so sad. Sorry, Pinterest. Um, I mean, at least Dropbox has like a strategy to make money, whereas I feel like, for example, Twitter, who just IPO'd, I mean, they kind have... of has a strategy, but it's not really working. And... Well, not certainly not to the extent you know that Dropbox has. Dropbox has made freemium work, right? Hey, you get it for free, but if you really want the service to do what it's supposed to do, you need to pay. Well, and the other thing that they do is that I think is really clever is that they will partner up with, for example, on my S3, I logged in to my Dropbox account. And it goes, oh, we see you're logging in from a Samsung device. Here is 50 gigs of free storage for two years. Yeah, but I mean, Samsung's paying that rather than you, but they're yes, making money off that transaction. They are making money off that transaction. However, in two years, when that comes up, and I have more than my three gigs or whatever my free model is, what am I going to do? Take all that stuff off of Dropbox? No, I'm just going to pay the nominal 
whatever it is to keep my but 50 not, gigs but, of but online but storage. Part of it is, is it's not nominal because I refuse to pay for a Dropbox account. In fact, I, I run my own Pogo plug so that I don't have to worry about paying Dropbox. Um, no, that's because fair. for, let me see, $100 for a hard drive and $100 for a device, you can get a Pogo plug and you can host your own Dropbox. And sure, you don't have some of their fancy features, but for the basic idea of an online shared drive, I can do it in, in, in two, three years, it pays for itself. And so I have a Dropbox for work for people who insist on using it, but I don't keep any of my personal stuff in there because I was like, three gigs for me? Three gigs is nothing. I did oh, yeah, a, you deal with large. Um, I did a 15 gig files, transfer so. today. Yeah, you know, I had to buy a Thunderbolt drive for the amount of data I've got to move around. And so, you know, when I'm sharing, like, for my research assistant stuff, sure, we use Dropbox all the time. But for anything I'm doing in my personal life, like the photos on my iPhone, like I had photo syncing on for a while, and I had to turn that off because it filled up my Dropbox. I, oh yeah, I, I turned that off because it was doing it whenever I'd plug my camera in, and you right. know, I have a 32 gig card, and it was almost always full, so. Right, so that, that basic that basic account is just crap. I mean, it really is. But it, the other thing you have to remember is that you and I are definitely not the average user sure. when we're talking about media files because sure. you know we both have DSLRs. You produce large files of video All and the audio, time. All and the time. and even just image like Photoshop files. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so. For the average consumer where you're moving around like Word documents and PowerPoints and like normal people things and like some images. Well, I mean, it depends what you mean by normal people things. Um, When I was teaching in – when I was with Teacher America, we had a Dropbox of all of these resources that you could download. And it just – it filled up my two gigs. Just the resources being shared by these teachers just because it was, you know, image files of lesson plans. And – it ended up filling up the two gigs. And so I was just in this never ending struggle of, well, I really want to keep these resources and I really want access to them, but then I just can't use my Dropbox or personal at all. Well, and the solution is you just set up a Dropbox under your Teacher America um, yeah, okay. account. So, so I commit sock puppetry, which I think is against their terms of service. It probably is. And, but that's my point. Like, yeah, they make freemium work for them and everyone loves Dropbox, but I would love something with a much larger opening storage like for instance SkyDrive. Okay. Yeah, that's what we've been right. using um the with the the teachers that I team with at school, we've been using SkyDrive this year to share lesson plans and all the data that we have to collect and scheduling stuff and you know, it's it's been our go to. And so for me, you know, SkyDrive used to get just 20 gigs free, and now I don't think you get that much. But I still think you get more than Dropbox for free. And well, with Google, you get 5 gigs. With Box, you get like 10 gigs. And right. I don't know. I have so many different accounts of so much little bits of free storage. But, I, I mean, is Dropbox worth $8 billion? I don't think so. But Well, I mean, just brand-wise, they were kind of first to this. It's the one that everyone thinks of. That's true, and and some big company can come in and scoop up Dropbox if they really, really wanted to and brand their cloud storage as Dropbox. And you know what? People would use it. Well, what I wonder also is I, I think Dropbox is smart to be diversifying because this, you know, this very limited storage thing ain't going to last forever. I'm um, sure well, it's really they simple. They have so many competitors. And they have so many competitors. This idea of branching out of the enterprise and doing all that kind of stuff, I, I think, makes a ton of sense. Um, Agreed. So uh, something that doesn't make quite as much sense to me is what the heck is the NFL doing? Well, the what NFL and Major League Baseball. And, and my actual thing I care about, Major League yeah, Baseball. Yeah, so, so Trey, you, you do enjoy watching America's pastime on television, correct? On actual – well, yeah, sure. I watch baseball. I, Oh, oh, I was talking about football. That's, we, that's not not officially. That's not America's pastime. <laughs> that's America's well, blood sport. <laughs> that's yes. We go to war over our you know teams. Maybe you know. Never mind. Um, well, well, if you don't pay for cable, you might not have the joy of watching either football or baseball on a broadcast station. Um, th- so that would be me as the, the I'm I'm the token um, over the air. So Jimmy, the, you're a cord cutter. <laughs> yeah, and unfortunately, this week, both the NFL and Major League Baseball filed an amicus brief with the Supreme Court uh, stating that... That's a friend of the court brief, by the way. You know what? Way. I, 
it's funny because I actually translated that from the, uh, from the all last things D article. I, I just looked at it. It said friend of the court brief. And I went, no, it's an amicus brief. I'm just yes. not going to do this nonsense of friend of the court. Anyways. Well, it, uh, it, descri- it is more descriptive. It lets people who don't understand the Latin roots what that means. It means they're not involved with the case. They're writing in to add content to it as a friend of the court. That right. just sounds shady when you call it friend of the court. It's what amicus right. means. I, I understand that, but amicus sounds less shady. Right, it, it, sounds, sounds it sounds less Al Capone. Anyway. Um, but well, they, what they're doing is straight up Al Capone. They filed a friend of the court brief with the Supreme Court, uh, stating that if the court does not hear the case, uh, the broadcasters have against uh, Aereo, so that'd be CBS, NBC, all of them, um, that they will move their programming to cable where they can reach retain the retransmission licensing rights uh so for those of you not familiar with this case we've talked about it before aereo is that little startup that does the stupid thing where they have a dedicated antenna for every single user but it's like a size of a dime and it's been it's held up in court that they can do that and then they will can stream broadcast, that antenna. They, they can stream the what's coming off that antenna over the internet and not have to pay retransmission fees and they currently. so they charge you ten dollars a month for the privilege and, and it was about the whole like in new york you can't actually get a signal even if you're downtown because of like the way buildings anyways um but does this my thing is does this threat from the nfl and major league baseball really carry any weight because they're already really moving to espn so well i mean it does carry weight in that plenty of folks still expect on their local channel to see you know that block and it's actually what's part of what gives the local channels so much value on the weekends during the week prime time um gives them some value but on the weekends it's sports particularly the mlb nascar um and the nfl so you have two of the big players in that triumvirate saying hey we're just going to go cable only and i think most people won't really notice um, most people who are either who have cable or satellite or who are already used to kind of watching their sports at bars won't care because the bars will buy it and the rest of us already have cable or satellite. Well, they're, they're, no, the bars already buy it. Right. That's what I mean. They have they're, the direct TV Sunday ticket thing already. Or, so. Yeah. Or the, or the MLB equivalent. It's sure. the MLB TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's my point. Like for most people, they won't really notice. This is more of a principled thing than it's going to impact. It's going to impact the cord cutters and it's going to impact those who aren't cord cutters but also don't have cable. But see, here's what I'm wondering about. So right now, the things like MLB.TV, like if we have that account, we can't watch Braves games because we're in Atlanta and it's, it's blacked out because you can watch it on your local station. But if you can no longer watch it on your local station, does that mean you can get it on MLB.tv? Yeah, it'll be it'll be the end. Of, prob- presumably, would then be the end of blackouts. Okay, so that no, being the case, it won't be the end of blackouts because there's, that mean there's that weirdness. Cord cutters well, but, can still get it because now it's available on a different service. Well, that works so for the MLB, but that, that wouldn't work for N- NFL anyway. Oh, well. Yeah, the NFL, NFL doesn't offer any kind of thing. However, um, yeah. you can get. Right so, for baseball. example, I have Comcast. Through Comcast, you can get. Um, access to the Watch ESPN app and um, streaming online, so you you don't ha- actually have to have ESPN to watch ESPN, which is kind of nice. I've never really used it um, as much as maybe. It Does is it intended. actually broadcast everything ESPN is showing? No, it ah. it has specific things that it'll broadcast, and it's and not as limited not as it once was when it was ESPN um, three sixty three sixty. Uh, it's now much more, but it's still not everything it could be. However, there is an argument that everything that if if the NFL and MLB were to move to a cable only model, they would have to find other ways to market their content because the NFL, especially MLB, less so because there's just so many games as it is. Mm-hmm. Um, but NFL, you tune in Monday Night Football is really the only thing that's not on. Broadcast. Uh, broadcast yeah. station. But I mean, look, Monday Night Football is still huge. I think we're just still ingrained. I, I think because the NFL happens on set days, Sunday, Yeah, it Monday. happens on Sunday, Monday, and Thursday, by and the way. And some points in the season Thursday. No, unlike every... It's, it's now not, every week, by yeah, the way. It didn't used to be. It didn't used to be. Okay. They added as that. As long as I remember... Look, I don't watch football. I remember look, it didn't used money, to always... They're money-grubbing bastards. Yes, they, and that's kind of the point here, right? is they are kind of money-grubbing bastards. 
Um, and, you know, and they sell these contracts to the broadcast networks for billions. I think Apple should just buy the contracts. Apple could just <laughs> buy the NFL. No, I think, I think uh, Google, going back to what we reported on a few weeks ago, I think Google should buy the NFL and um, put them in a Sunday floating ticket stadium. Thing. Yeah, put them in. Yes, with, with, brilliant. <laughs> surrounded by sharks. <laughs> no, well, it might. Never mind. I'm not going there. <laughs> so something else you might want to put in a tank surrounded by sharks is your cell phone because the carriers <laughs> don't really want you to be able to protect it. So there are a lot of perks uh, involved in us having smaller and more portable technology as time progresses. Um, but one downfall of this uh, relative improvement is that it's a lot easier these days for someone to walk off with your various mobile devices. Wah, wah, so you mean sad. the very portable thing that I carry in my pocket is portable for other people too? It is. And Both of them are. <laughs> port it away from you. Uh, so in order to combat this problem, Samsung wants to uh, preload its phones with absolute low-jack anti-theft software, uh, which basically would allow phone owners to brick a device if it was stolen. Which is uh, great. Which mm. sounds, sounds like, like a good idea. A fruit company offers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's oddly enough, it's similar to find my iPhone. Which is because it's a good idea. No, it's a great idea. For, I mean, for once, I will say, like, Samsung, let's do that. So what's the problem? That sounds like a brilliant idea. Samsung thinks it's a good idea. We think it's a good idea. But uh, the carriers do not think it's a good idea. Uh, so that would be AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint, and U.S. Cellular. Speaking uh, of money-grubbing bastards. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, so that lovely uh, group of folks have all demanded that Samsung remove this kill switch feature from any and all handsets on which it has already been installed um, and basically they say nope you, you can't ship with this we don't like it uh, and the carriers are basing their opposition on a claim that this feature uh, can be too easily exploited by hackers Oh, wait, so, wait, they played the hacker card? Yeah, no, they, they the literally did. Card. Oh, no, that that's dangerous because that could be hacked. Unlike all the tracking they're already doing of you, no, that can't easily be hacked. Like although the carrier it has, ID stuff? Like the carrier ID stuff, which has been hacked by the U.S. government. Not That's not tinfoil hat. It has been hacked by the U.S. government. It has actually been hacked by the U.S. government. So, like, not like the stuff that's already been hacked by the U.S. government. This stuff, which is just involving the technology that is already on the phone, the technology that has been built in, it's just another way to use it. No, that can be too easily hacked. <laughs> I think something else is going on here, Sydney. What might that be? Uh, well, skeptics like you, Trey, uh, believe that there are some ulterior motives here uh, from the carriers as far as why they're rejecting this, what we was proposed as a safety feature um so of course when a phone gets stolen it means profit for the carriers whether it means somebody goes and buys a new phone uh or they you know pay up on their insurance plan that they have on said phone um so i don't know guys what do you think is, is this really a sensible safety feature from samsung or are the carriers right and this is just a a, a danger and a security risk waiting to happen I mean, this is the second story that is just straight up al capone hey look <laughs> we're not gonna let you protect your phone but you're going to pay insurance to us you want your phone to be safe you pay us well that's like the same thing with sprint's shenanigans of anyways i'm not going there on this show again but no i <laughs> The stupid, well, you need to get an yeah. insurance policy because, you know, something might happen to your phone. No, something, might happen, <laughs> something might happen to your phone. Well, you exactly. look away, you don't know what's going to happen. Something, you need protection. You pay me six bucks a month. Or what, I don't actually have no concept of how much it costs. You pay no, me uh, okay. six bucks a month, so, I'll low jack your phone. So for the S3, it, was, it would have been $13 a month oh, for my what? insurance. And I wanted to, I almost did, look at the person, because I got the S3 based on um, a test that was done on the now defunct Always On show where they put it in a washing machine um, and it survived. There was one of the, and they threw it and they did all of their crazy battery of tests to it and it survived. And I went, that's the phone for me because I'm rough on devices and it survives still, even though I dropped it on concrete. Even though it's and a they wanted to device. sell me a $13 a month insurance plan on it's top of... That's $156 a year. Yes. You, it means in the life of the phone, you're paying an additional $300 because something might happen to it. And I, I bought this phone um, used on eBay for $300. And so I, I did that math and I said, no, I'll just buy another one. 
Also, well, it's and a- then if you lose it or it's damaged by water damage, you then have to pay a hundred dollar deductible mm-hmm. in order to get a new phone. Okay, but let let's bring this in perspective. One in three robberies in the United States today involve phone theft. It I costs. Believe- According to Yahoo News, which is just reporting out of AP, so according to AP, that is costing United States consumers $30 billion a year. In 2012, that that cost U.S. consumers $30 billion. You want to know where that $30 billion then went back to? It was the cell phone companies. This is big business capitalizing on human suffering. In, like, this really direct way. We don't have to look at, like, factory working conditions. This is literally consumers being exploited. These phones should be easier to find. Full stop. And this is exploiting. And the other thing that is just bizarre is they let Apple have this feature. Uh, Maybe not let It might be the Mm, wrong word. But Apple (laughs) has this feature. Uh, But... They're going to push around Samsung, a right? And they actually said, dollar. Well, no, it's even weirder than that because they've said that any Android phone that ships with any of this kind of deactivation stuff, they're going to take it off. They're not going to allow them on our, on their network. Wait, okay. So, so here's my question though: What about unlocked phones? So I have an unlocked uh, Nexus Five. If my Nexus Five had this LoJack software on it. Like, well, first off, Sprint would just not give me a SIM card because they're anarchists. But you're not allowed to have a. They they they're not allowing phones preloaded with a kill switch that would deactivate the phone if it was stolen because it would be too easy to hack. They're they're not subsidizing phones or they're not allowing. I think they're telling the the Samsung and the other manufacturers don't make the phones that way because it's already built it's it's already potentially built into to android and it's just not being used so can we can we discuss the ways that we really just need to get out of this horrible relationship we all have with cell phone carriers yeah but what literally what do you want to do well in that (laughs) yeah Amen. Because once you get locked into a two-year contract with one of these carriers, you're just kind of st- you're just kind of stuck. Yes. The early termination fees are exorbitant. Exorbitant, and they I mean they've gone up over time. Yeah. Well, and then they also, if you look at it, in many cases, they reserve the right to increase them without mm-hmm. telling you right. during the course of your plan. Right. Fascinating. So the contract that you signed, yeah. I, well, the contract you signed is meaningless. My my recent ex- exposure to trying to put an unlocked phone on um, Sprint has just made me really anti the U.S. model for cell phones. Sure. And and so as a result of that, I think that I personally am ready for all of the carriers to go the way of T-Mobile and offer cheaper plans with non-subsidized phones. Sure. And where's the market pressure to do that? Uh, hopefully it's increasing because of sure hopefully. yeah because the well, average consumer understands what three hundred fifty dollars sure yeah absolutely and I just spent two hundred dollars and bought a new iPhone as compared to like seven hundred dollars no no but but that's no, never the price people see I you know can't you can't tell me oh that's really seven hundred fifty dollars yeah. And my car was really $22,000. But as far as I'm concerned, my car is $450 a month. That's something very different. We are used to, we paid 200 bucks when we got this awesome phone. You're never going to be able to convince a consumer, oh, just pay $400. Well, why? This one's $200. Well, it's not really $200 if you amortize it over, fine, <laughs> great. Well, but that's but, not how consumers think, and you know it. But if things like this keep coming up that push consumers... If one of these companies was to break from the others and say, oh, no, we'll allow it, all of a sudden that could become something that they yeah. could, you know. I mean, it, it could be. I don't know. But- I, I, I think that this is horrible, but I, I don't know what the solution is other than consumer pressure to say we want this and you're well, I mean, taking advantage. Your options but- are consumer pressure or regulation. And you're going to get neither. I want regulation. Consumer pressure is in a, consumer in this case. Consumer pressure is ineffective because what's your other choice? 
Right. That's that's all of the major national carriers. Right. What's your other choice? That's collusion, actually, is what that is. Mm, very clever. Yeah, and I, you, I mean, you're going to be hard-pressed to actually prove that, but it is basically collusion. Um, something that doesn't feel like collusion is this year's console launches. So, um, Even though they launched like a week apart. <laughs> even though they launched kind of like a week apart. Um, it turns out that there might just be demand for new games consoles after all. Sony is reporting that they sold 1 million PlayStation 4s in the first 24 hours. Now let me put that in perspective in terms of game consoles for you. This is three times the rate of sales of the original Xbox 360s, which sold in roughly the 300,000s in their first 24 hours. And that was, by the way, eight years ago today. Happy birthday to the um, Xbox 360. Aww. This Your is Red Ring of Death is still just as terrible as it was when you came out. Yeah, I still have one that's a Red Ring of Death risk. Um, the other interesting statistic is this is still twi- This is roughly twice the number of Wii U's that have sold in a year. And PS4 <laughs> did it in a day. Okay. There's your problem. <laughs> by the way, Wii U has a ton of really good games out right now. Um, both of the Nintendo plat- platforms do. So Un- whereas, unlike actually both the Xbox 3 or Xbox One and the PS4. Unlike the Xbox One and the PS4, there are great games for the Wii U right now. Um, Super Mario 3D World is an amazingly tight Mario experience. The 3DS has one of the best Zelda games in years. Um, in or the just sequel. go buy a PS3 and play The Last of Us. And play Beyond The Last Souls. of Us, Beyond Two Souls, and Assassin's Creed. So look, if you're actually look, if you are not as stupid early, and we're going to talk about this in the next story too, and a couple stories down. But if you're not a crazy, <laughs> crazy early adopter like the rest of us, just buy a Wii U or buy a PS3 or enjoy the one you have because that's where the really good games are. But anyways, Go Wii U. Sony's going to need to sell a lot of these things um, because IHA's eye supply has broken down the components and claimed that the PS4 costs roughly $381 to make. In hardware. You, in hardware. If you build into that marketing, R&D, and a $400 price point, Sony is losing money on on every unit they ship and they're planning to make up in game sales. This isn't this is not at all uncommon for this stage in a console race. But what's interesting and, and only Nintendo makes money at launch. Everyone else loses money for a time. Except however, on the Wii U. Huh? Except on the Wii U. Then it's right at cost. Um, however, Sony's in better shape than they were last time around. When they launched the PS3, they were selling the console for like six hundred dollars. Which is Which was exorbitant. And it still is. Despite the fact that it cost eight hundred and five dollars to make, hmm. okay, even I can do that math. Yeah. <laughs> um, so based on this yeah, and our experience with the PS4, does Sony have a bright future ahead with its PS4? Uh, that word "bright" is kind of dicey. <laughs> Positive, potentially lucrative. I mean, what do you want? Are they going to make money on this thing? I mean, a reasonable probably- amount. They will probably make money on it because especially if at launch, that's what their breakdown is. Um, And these consoles are going to have at least a a three or four year life. At least probably Mm. more like five or six. Well, probably more like they're never going to have a replacement. Uh, Um, It'll just become another thing that is not what we are currently thinking of as a console. I I, I don't think that I will bet you a thousand dollars. I will bet you a thousand dollars that that is not the case. I'll bet you the ne- a next gen console. Fine, yeah, okay, fine. That that okay. let let's do that, because because if I lose, there's nothing to pay. Um, no, no, no. What, what, you get to anyways. Never mind. Sure. Um, we'll bet a next gen console. I will bet there's a gen after this. Um. I, I I, the PC PC market's just not there. It's too complicated. But there will no, always it, it, be. There will always be space for a turnkey solution that hooks up to your television. Right, but my argument is that it's not going to be a console. Well, define console. Console in the sense that it's a standalone device that plugs into your TV by itself. Are we passing notes in class, children? It's the uh, the low tech chat. Okay. No, they don't have a Ridge Racer game. For, Ridge this is the first. This is the first PlayStation launch ever without a Ridge, Ridge Racer game, Our um, which is notable. Low tech chat question from Mr. Stephen Doss, who, who is just poked his head in the studio. <laughs> We're doing some studio. release coverage tonight. Hi, Stephen. Um, um, he says hi. But no, I he can't hear you. I, I I mean I can't guarantee you because I can't see the future. But I will bet you the price of a new of, of a next gen console. So fi- we'll call it five hundred bucks. That there will be another one. 
after yeah. this because there's always going to be that space for a turnkey solution that you replace separate to your television, which is how I define. No, but you, no, because here's my point. You are all. You can keep pointing that all you want, For and they said the same thing. Of, listening to this on audio, Jimmy's pointing to his phone. Right, and you could have said in 1989, you could have made that same argument about the Game Boy, but it didn't kill it because fundamentally, you can always put better hardware in a bigger box, and so you can have incredible immersive graphical experiences that you can never have, because in the end, you lose tech power as you minimize. Even in the far-flung future, when we're using nanotechnology holographic processors, you're going to be able to put a more powerful one in a bigger box and make have better experiences. Right, I think there's always going to be space for AAA games. And there's but my always argument is be- the razor edge of, of cell phones, which is not inconceivable in the next five years. Sure, but I think there's still going to be... How about the play... Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for derailing Trey. <laughs> my point but, but my point is is sure, you can do all of that and all of that will exist. And then someone is going to have unbelievable graphics from a from a roughly one foot by one foot box that hooks up into your television. Right, but you you and I always have talked about how, you know, you look at Bioshock Infinite, it's a beautiful game and it mm-hmm. really maximizes, like especially on the PC, which has a higher graphical output than current generation of um I guess it's now, now last gen. generation. Last, it's now last gen. The next um, gen is among us. Next yes. gen is now, now, now. So if you compare the Xbox 360 to the PC experience for Bioshock Infinite, but, I mean, it's so much better on the PC. Mm-hmm. But it's a two hundred million dollar game. Yes. And so at at some point you reach that. Does it really make sense for studios to keep going higher and higher and higher res? Well, you actually left out... the law of diminishing returns. No, you've, you've left out the point that clinches it, okay? What is more powerful than an Xbox 360? My PC? No, that's not, so that's not the right answer. What is more powerful than an Xbox 360? A PS3? Still not, yes, but still Xbox not the answer I'm looking for. What device that proves, that proves your point oh, is no, more... Oh, no, it's the, um, um, what, what, one of the Apple it's devices. the iPad the Apple third gen. That's what it is. The iPad third gen is more powerful than an Xbox 360. That's a stupid um, argument. You no, know. it's not. Not, but not by your very argument. You build something, you hook that up to a television, you could have theoretically pumped the same graphics as a 360. True. No, it would have cooked the damn thing, and it's not a really good way to do it. But in terms okay. of raw processing power versus what hardware can take advantage of. But you're talking p- about a power PC architecture versus an ARM architecture, and those things are not necessarily comparable. No, but I'm, I'm just talking in, in terms of raw flops. Actual power. But something that a Microsoft pro- so starting our kind of I said Sony and Microsoft holiday. So moving into our, our first Microsoft holiday story. Um, good news for wi- the Windows Phone faithful, of which I am one. Um, the must-have oh, apps of the season. the nineties. Yeah. Um, the must-have apps of the season are uh, finally starting to come to the number three phone platform. This week, it was announced that Google's social mapping app Waze and a limited version of Instagram by Facebook are coming to Windows Phone. Uh, wait, wait, wait. It was announced that they're coming or they're released? I don't actually. That, <laughs> that's a really key question that I cannot I'll, I'll look it up. necessarily answer. Um, so Waze is, actually works the way it's supposed to, just like it does on every other device, where you just have great socially. Waze is now available. Yeah, okay. So you just have, it. and I think Instagram is too. Um, so Waze works just the way I think it was. You plug it in, you navigate, and there's social information built into that. Oh, um, in, Instagram, yep. Instagram is somewhat in beta still, okay? So you can take pictures in Instagram. But, but it's, it's not re- a Google product. I don't understand. Yeah, but it's really mm-hmm. buried within menus, and you can't take video, and it's kind of clunky. But hey, we have it. We have it on the Windows phone. I don't actually care, but people do, I've been told. Um <laughs> This is also interesting because Kantar um, reported recently that Windows Phone now holds 4.6% of the U.S. market and close to 10% of the market in Europe, but is badly behind in the emerging market of China. So, as a Windows Phone user, I'm excited about the new apps and it starts to bring it closer to parity. But to y'all, looking in from the outside, does this change y'all's impression of Windows Phone? Well, oh, I now can't make fun of Windows Phone for not having Instagram. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And I can still make fun of you for the Samsung Galaxy 3 S3's battery life. 
True. Yeah, not not being a heavy app user myself, I, I mean, it's not necessarily something that affects my opinion too much, but I, I know that as far as the general population, I, I hear that people like Instagram. So, you know, the kids these days and their crazy Instagram. So I feel like in general, this is going to do good things for It's just part of the rise of the 80s. Is the Instagram the thing they use for the sexting? <laughs> that's Snapchat! Oh, oh that's Thank Snapchat! Snapchat. <laughs> Let's bring up Snapchat. Yeah, we didn't bring up Snapchat. Sna- this, this isn't a story in our rundown, um, but Snapchat... Um, had, had apparently turned down a three billion dollar offer yeah, from from, uh, from, from Yahoo Face- from Facebook no, excuse me Facebook. from Facebook um, saying they're more some, valuable despite the fact that they say that Facebook oh, made a, totally an offer to Snapchat of so, three billion dollars so, and some say Snapchat told them where to go and how where, to get where there. to go and how to get there um, so apparently Snapchat despite having zero idea on how to monetize thinks it's worth more than three billion dollars I think not. Fascinating. <laughs> fascinating. But I think this is fascinating for Windows Phone. I this think it's is good go- for Windows Phone. Yeah. This is so, I, I mean, like Windows Phone platform, even though I don't have one. I mean, I, I really enjoy... The, I don't like the keyboard. If I have to get really nitpicky, I don't like Windows Phone's keyboard, but I'm also just trained to like the Apple keyboard. And you just kind of get used... It's not bad. I, that, you just put kind whatever of get, keyboard I want on Android. That's that's really the truth of that. Because I don't like the Android keyboard, the built-in one. I don't like, I've been yeah. using it for the last two weeks, and I don't like it. Um, but I also have Swift key, which is like the best keyboard in the world. So, yeah. so I I think this is you know this is good news for Windows Phone. I until the Instagram app, really Windows Phone's not going to be there until you can go. You don't have to think is that app going to be there when it's not a remarkable story when we say oh it has this app that everyone else had. Instagram launched launched three years ago. It launched on Android last year, and now it's on Windows right. Phone and not well, very good. However, I would say that Waze is a good thing um, yeah. because for those of, that are not on Nokia, I, I just started using Waze on Android. Um, and well, first off, because I now have battery life, so I can actually <laughs> use things like Waze. Um, but I, I really like it. I think it works really well. And so, Trey, you need to create a Waze account and use Waze so we can you know, know where each other are at all times. No. Creepy. But see, because I use hard drive based Nokia maps, which yeah, is much no, better I, on battery life. Your maps, which is. I, if I could buy here maps and download it on Android, I probably would. I well, with the spin with with Nokia's maps division being spin out basically into a separate company, not tied to Windows probably Phone. Probably available um, end of the first quarter, beginning of the second quarter yeah. of next year. So you're going to get it. And my I, I, just I, shot in the dark guess that'll be one of my predictions. I highly recommend it. it they're great maps. Um, but uh, something else I, I highly recommend is uh, is this from week or Microsoft nonetheless from Microsoft nonetheless is this week's gadget. After we wrap here in exactly an hour, um, Stephen and I will be heading out into the cold uh, to stand in line to pick up um, my uh, the, the office's Xbox One. Um, expect an unboxing video tonight um, and a six-hour live stream of power uh, starting at 8 p.m. tomorrow night, starring Sydney, uh, Stephen, and I. Um, however, and all point. the coffee, and all the coffee, all the coffee. We're gonna play Connect Sports. That's not out yet. No. They actually, <laughs> Stephen is talking about Connect Sports Rivals. There's only a demo available in the App Store that wow. won't be launching until Q1. Um, wow. Sorry about that. Um, however, now um, you know how I feel about Drive Club. Yeah. Um, before then, the mainstream tech press has already gotten their hands on the device and has published their reviews. So essentially. The Xbox One feels more like the future than the PS4, with all its interfacing, cable box controlling, voice controlling wizardry. However, voice control can be spotty at times, and it's just not all quite there yet. Two of the launch titles, particularly Forza 5 and Dead Rising 3, tend to be, tend to be reviewing much higher than the average of Sony's launch lineup. Um, but Rise, Son of Rome is a disappointment. Yeah, but what's Sony's launch lineup of, of exclusives? Killzone, um, Knack. Killzone, Knack, and... Rezogun. Rezogun. So, look, I mean, on GameSpot, which is the, kind of the, one of the review sites I follow very closely, um, they both got nines, um, as compared to Killzone, which got a seven, and Knack, which got a four. Killzone deserves a seven. 
And Knack, Knack deserves deserves a three. And <laughs> Giant Bomb gave it a two. And look, it's just a bad game. Okay, we, we <laughs> talked about this in the last episode. It's just a bad game. I'm, I'm going to beat it just for the lols. Because you hate yourself, and you're I not just... behind on Game of the Year at all, are you? Because that's really going to be in a contender. Because we're, it's, a, it's a top ten list, and clearly that's going to be a top ten game of the year. Rezo Gun's going to be on there for me. I love that game. You can have your own top ten list. <laughs> <laughs> You will put Rezo Gun on that list over my dead body. That's not true. We'll have this fight on the internet later in December. Um, wars. In short, though, the wisdom around the industry is the same as what we said for the PS4. Unless you're a crazy earlier adopter, wait until the launch of Titanfall and Destiny in the spring. If you really are into Dead Rising or Forza, 5, Forza as, as a franchise, hey, dive right in. The games that are good are there already. There's a side note to this here, though. Um, the interface and the media magic might give Xbox One greater potential in the long run. That potential is just not fully realized yet. So, Sydney, are you excited about soon to be welcoming an Xbox One into our home? Oh, what a what a special time! It in is our a lives. special time. The <laughs> Xbox 360 launched eight years ago today. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, I, I am also very impressed that our Xbox 360 still functions the way that it does. It's a launch version, man. Pretty and awesome. Also, it's the launch version arcade, which has like 75% of it's them la- ring of death. Launch ver- version, version Pro, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm excited to actually, I mean, I, I have, I was going to say to actually see it. I did see it uh, in a Microsoft store briefly. I have not actually gotten to play yet. Um, so excited about that. I'm really excited particularly to see the 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 improved Connect um, functionality because I, you know I like Connect. I, I'm judging. probably the only per hey hush. Not not you. I'm, I'm oh. looking at Trey. Okay, judging Trey. That, that's judging okay. Trey. You can judge Trey. Don't judge me. Um, I like Connect. I think it's cool. <laughs> Um, so I'm excited to see the improved integration and hopefully, you know, obviously right now it's probably not um, being used to its, um, what am I trying to say? To its fullest extent. Fullest potential, yeah. thank you, by by the games that are available, but hopefully developers will continue to work with that and improve that as we go forward. So well, yeah, you can, I'm excited. You can even do like crazy stuff with Connect, right? You can say, Xbox, sync controller. Hold up a controller and it'll sync. Oh, fun. You can hold up QR codes that are on pieces of paper and install games. Important question. Will I still be able to order pizza with it? I don't know if there's a Pizza Hut app yet. There better be. Otherwise, I'd be really disappointed. Will our live streams ruin tomorrow? Yeah, I, yes, Stephen. <laughs> so we have to keep the Xbox 360 hooked up so that we can still order pizza. Because yeah, we can't do that from the media, BC, or our phones. Not um, by talking to it. <laughs> so, from, talk I guess if you phone. talk to your phone. Yeah, but then you have to talk to a person. No, but I, I'd say, so, like, I have a PS4, Honestly. right? But mm-hmm. my, um, when I was, I remember watching the Xbox keynote when they originally announced the Xbox One. Mm-hmm. And... I, I think that all in all, what Microsoft is trying to accomplish with the Xbox One is far more ambitious than mm-hmm. what Sony is trying to accomplish yeah. with the PS4. Microsoft is trying to become the one device to rule them all. And I, we can debate whether or not they're actually going to succeed they got pr- that. Okay, so they got pretty close. because but They're definitely much closer than Sony yeah. is. Well, and Microsoft's kind of crazy in how they did it. So as it turns out, the Kinect is also an IR blaster. Yeah, no, I knew that. That's that's crazy. That's yeah, how it can it, work with everything. And so that way, when you tell Xbox One on, or Xbox on, or whatever. Xbox the, on. Is, Xbox, engage. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you can set that up. Computer. The, um, Computer. It'll turn on your TV and the Xbox. And your receiver and your cable box. The Kinect is what controls all of those things. Mm-hmm. And so I think that they're, it's just crazy enough to work. Well, I, I think as they refine the software, I think I, I, right now... So the PS4's interface, which is just fundamentally not as good. Like, it's a better than the PS3's interface. Which yeah, is okay, better so it's a better than a dog turd. It, it, it's better, better than, than my Amiga than from 92. It's better, better than the CD playing functionality in the Dreamcast. <laughs> Wait, I got one. It's better than Moto Blur. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, yes, I, yeah. Okay, it is. Moto Blur. It's better than the Microsoft Kin Spot. Actually, the Kin Spot was really easy only. to use. <laughs> In name only. So, 
from what micro from the future that Microsoft is doing to the mi- future that Microsoft could have been doing. Tell me about another product we've been really interested in this week, Jimmy. Yeah, I, so I'm going to say it. Steve Jobs was wrong. That's right. You heard me. I said it. Steve Jobs was Jimmy, you wrong. You say that every week in some way or another. <laughs> it would be interesting if I said that. I try to say that Steve Jobs is wrong as often as humanly possible. Um, he was wrong. First of all, fruit fruit cannot like sustain you yeah it doesn't cure cancer it turns Being out anyways um doesn't work. so steve jobs believed that on- the only stylus that you need is your finger and he was really big on this whole point now granted that's because of the resistive touch screens yeah pick pick a finger pick, pick a finger <laughs> Or, I hate it when it does that. My, my, my personal favorite, um, hey, Boy Scout, read between the lines. Yeah. Um, so, anyways, continue. Anyways. Um, all right, children. <laughs> yeah, all you need is your finger. However, luckily for us, 53 Inc., the makers of the beautiful iOS app Paper, disagree. Uh, this week, they did announce a new hardware complement to their app called Pencil. Yes. Now, Pencil. Pencil. Creative not, with the naming oh, I, there. I, where'd it go? Never mind. I had a pencil for that. Anyways, pencil is an active stylus, which means it connects to the iPad using Bluetooth, and I assume it's Bluetooth 4.0, um, and uses an actuator within de- the device itself to actually detect how hard you press down on the screen. Uh, the stylus itself is shaped like a traditional carpenter's pencil mm-hmm. and is available in both aluminum finish and a um, walnut finish. Which looks beautiful. Yeah, it's fifty dollars for the aluminum and sixty dollars for the walnut. Now, for with that price, you also unlock all of the downloadable in-app purchases that are available within the paper app. Um, which paper itself is it's a freemium, so you, you get it for free and you can buy extra. Yeah. You but know. then they're all kind of reasonably priced, anyways. It's like two yeah. bucks for this, three bucks for that. Like it's yeah, not... it's like well, it's like a dollar for each of the packs. But I think it's total for ten bucks, you can get all the packs. Yeah, is which what is, it is which is just not. I mean, not that bad. I, 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 for everything that you get out of it. But anyways, um, the the question really is: Is this good or freaking awesome? It, it, it is honestly freaking awesome. The only way, reason why I haven't bought one yet is I don't yet have my iPad Mini with Retina display, and I'm waiting on. Um, I'm waiting to see what a, the Adobe Mighty Pen is going to be, because um, I think that's its direct competitor. And you reminded me, Jimmy, of an interesting piece of history. Why we linked this to a Microsoft story? So back before the around the time the iPad original iPad was going to launch, Microsoft was working on a project called Career. What Career was was this awesome like book like tablet that was all yeah, about it had, it had screens on both sides. Screens on both sides with like a really deeply integrated stylus, and it just looked like it was gonna be the most beautiful, amazing thing in the world. Uh, here, um, I, I've actually got a video for that. I'll drop a video for that into the show notes. Yeah. So the team that makes paper and pencil, a lot of them are exiles from the team that came up with the courier concept for Microsoft. So this is a window into a future that Microsoft could have been pioneering and chose not to because possibly Steven Sanofsky's a jerk. Well, if, if you believe everything Thanks. that Paul Therott and Mary Jo Foley say, then yes, that is exactly why the courier didn't happen. Um, I, you know, I, I think that this thing is really cool, and it, it starts to bridge that gap between what I actually use a paper and pencil for in the real world and that digital equivalent. Because everyone has tried one of those stupid passive oh, capacitive awful. styluses. I, mm-hmm. And the lag is just ridiculous, and and they don't work particularly well, and they have the stupid, like flimsy tip on it because the iPad doesn't understand what a non finger is. I, you know, it, I can give the iPad a lot of fingers. I, you know, I have a finger for the iPad. It's but, very specific. But for me, my big fear with these things is the lag. Right? If there is, if there's still getting the lag, I'll stick either with my smart pen or just sketching things out on paper. Um, what a novel concept. Well, I, I know. But I, w- I would prefer to have it already digital so that I can pass around my ideas or if I need to draw out a wiring diagram or whatever, like I can just send that along easily. I'd much rather have it on my iPad, th- my future iPad. Um, <laughs> um, also filing. Also filing. Not having a bazillion papers. Yeah. I mean, I, just, I get tired of losing all of my papers, and, and I do that quite a bit. Well, so, And that's really my problem, that I, I'll, you know, I have a pad next to my... Uh, keyboard at work 
and I write, I jot things down on it, and mm-hmm. oftentimes they're important things, and then I lose the piece of paper when I tear it off and go to the next sheet. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of all the or notepads the that notebook. I have on my desk at school that, you know, I've got maybe two or three pages left in them, and each page has maybe three sentences written on it of things that I meant to do, but then they just didn't happen because I put the notepad back on my desk, and having it all in one place where it's easier to organize and so, it's digital harder to lose as so as be. long as this has solved the lag issue that this or the mighty pen has solved actually solved the lag issue i'm in if it yeah, hasn't i suspect I'm that out. this is going to be one of those you get the pencil i get the mighty pen and, and we'll, we we'll test drive these things and see how they fight to the death. <laughs> um speaking of fighting to the death is this week's geeks anonymous Without a doubt, the worst episode ever. I think we should call it your grave. Ah, curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal. So, as Trey mentioned, the Xbox One will be released in uh, two months, one hour, one hour um, Eastern time. That's that's two hours uh, Central time, by the way. So, however. How do you get all of your midnight next gen gaming goodness in? When you I pump a lot the- of Red Bull to do the Mountain Dew and go, Wow! Yeah! Yeah, but what if you have work or school tomorrow, Trey? You pump a lot of, which I do, you pump a lot of Mountain Dew and you go, Wow! No, no, Mountain Dew's the 90s thing. We have like, you know, Red Bull and Monster now. You don't have to do that anymore. It takes or months. Both. Or both. Mountain Dew was the Counter Strike solution to the problem. There was like Mountain Dew themed Halo, Halo themed Mountain Dew. <laughs> it's like a Microsoft core partner. That's actually probably true. It, uh-huh. There was actually. It was. Anyways, keep going. A yeah, very anyways. important story. Now, now <laughs> the the solution to this, of course, is the Xbox One doctor's note, published um, by Microsoft. M Nelson, M D, X B One. That's Major Nelson, the P- that's, PR That's reference. Major Nelson, the entertainment therapy and specialist. Wait, is his name really uh, Major Nelson? Do, it's his handle know. on Xbox Live, dear. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, due to the zombie flu, your employee will not be able to fulfill the scheduled commitment he slash she has with you. Which I feel like yes. Atlanta employers will totally take as a legitimate excuse. <laughs> uh, I'm sure they will. Because of the severity of this condition, I'm prescribing a heavy dose of Xbox One. He needs to destroy zombies. After a thorough examination, I've concluded that the all-in-one entertainment system is the only cure for the aforementioned condition. This treatment may take anywhere from one to three days to work and will require years of accumulating achievements thereafter. If the patient is disrupted with work, I will have to double the prescribed amount to Xbox One. If used effectively, Xbox One can help relieve the patient's entertainment deprivation and will have an increased state of happiness at all times. And then uh, the note at the bottom says, please be advised that there may be some side effects. These include elevated gamer gamer score and swollen ego. They are to be expected and will contribute to the lifelong healing process. Yes. (laughs) So Trey, we'll be using this note to maximum effect tomorrow. Yes. Yes, I, more of that. <laughs> more of that in my life. Yes, uh, yeah, probably. Because um, I'm, I'm playing and hopefully beating Rise, Son of Rome tonight before the live stream tomorrow. <laughs> That's kind of my big plan. You're beating Rise, Son of. So, are you telling me that you're going to beat Rise, Son of Rome before I beat Killzone? It's going to make P- me sad. Potentially, I have actually have. If it's actually a six-hour game, yes. If it's more than a six-hour game, no. All right, new plan. I will beat Knack before you. <laughs> Good luck. I Starting don't. now. Because I hate um, life that much. You ha- you hate life. Something that will make you hate life is this <laughs> week's last call. Okay. <laughs> so, folks, be warned. If you are eating right now, stop. If you have eaten recently. Just or give up. If you just have oh. a sensitive stomach, you may want to skip the last call tonight. So seriously, you know, turn off your device, stop watching the live stream. You have been warned. You can't stop the signal, Sydney. Uh, you should stop the <laughs> signal. Because Thank you, David Crumholtz. This will turn your stomach. Uh, so tonight we bring you some smelly news um, from scientist Christina Agap. Oh, this is, it's Greek. Agap. Agap. <laughs> 
Go ahead. Agapicus. Agapicus. Yep. There you Christina Agapicus. That's the Greek. Uh, and scent specialist, who knew that was a thing? Scent specialist Cecil Tolas. Cecil Tolas. <laughs> who set out to answer that age old question uh, What would happen if we made cheese from celebrities' body bacteria? Yeah, no, that that's real. This is yeah, not because a, that's an yeah, age old th- question for everybody, question of course. Everybody's wanted to know. Uh, so they collected bacteria samples from the toes, okay. the mouths, Lovely. the noses, yes. uh, and even the tears yes. of a variety of celebrities, including food guru Michael Pollan, which is just hilarious. Uh, <laughs> and then they took that bacteria and they let it grow on cheese rinds to create some fascinating dairy delicacies. Um, so it turns out, according to our, our intrepid scientists that the cheeses that are created both smell and taste like the body odors of the people from whom the bacteria came delicious uh, it's just mm. yeah it's so if you want some cheese that tastes like michael pollan's toes you're in luck oh god um, so guys when are we gonna have text last call host flavored cheeses for sale on our website pretty much all i need is you this know this sounds like a winner whole unhomo- un- unhomogenized milk and some bacterial samples. I'm and sure you can get that at what white people like, you know. Right. So how markets. hard can, I mean, I don't mean to be whatever, but how hard can this really be? Yeah, well, and this did actually, first of all, the, when I read I this story. there's real science in this. The, yeah, the thing that this reminded me of was okay, the, the some, book some, Sideways Stories from Wayside School, keep, where they that there's the chapter where they make the yep. ice cream that tastes like everybody in the class. Um, but anyway, the, the the actual purpose behind doing this was essentially to raise awareness of the fact that all of that bacteria that lives on our bodies that we work really, really hard to kill and get rid of with scary chemicals um, and antibacterial stuff is no more dangerous or in a lot of cases, no more dangerous or harmful than the bacteria that's already in the cheese that we eat. That, and that, this was the Michael theory. Pollen is involved. And it's part of what makes us who we are. That's right. And on that note, and on that note, it's time to end. Thank you so much for joining us for another actually on time episode of Text Last Call. And we're all here. And we're all here. Please join us tomorrow night, uh, Friday, uh, starting at 8 p.m. Eastern for our live stream of power of the Xbox One. We will be playing Rise Son of Rome, Dead Rising 3, Forza 5, Killer Instinct, um, and maybe some other games that relate historically to these games. Um, so it should be a lot of fun. Uh, please join us. We'll be on from about um, 8 p.m. to 2 a.m. Uh, so you have plenty of time through through your Friday evening to spend some time with us. Also, check back uh, later tonight for the on-demand version of this episode and also a, un- a filmed unboxing of the Xbox One starring Stephen Doss. Um, if you have any feedback about the show or um, specials you'd like to see on the site, please email us, podcast at textlastcall.com, facebook.com slash textlastcall, pinterest.com slash textlastcall, or at textlastcall on the Twitters. However you find us, you'll be seeing us on the interwebs.